the Mises Institute is an extremely efficient organization. Can you hear me? It's an extremely efficient and well-run organization. I've never taught any university as well-run as this because it's run uh, on something closer to free market principles than is the case of a university. And, of course, one reason is none of us have tenure here, and so we do have to work a little harder. But there was one mistake made, and that was they asked me to give the lecture on Austrian economics and capital markets. And when we have two eminent professors in the audience, Professor Natoff and Professor Riesman, who should be giving the lecture, uh, but I am honored anyway to be asked and uh, uh, have spent a lot of time thinking about this, which is good, if not for you, at least for me, uh, <laughs> and so forth. The, uh, an announcement that the mud wrestling match between Professor Hoppe and Professor Gordon has been canceled for this evening. <laughs> and if you uh, have you, your tickets, you can get a refund. Uh, if you purchased a ticket, you can get a refund at the front desk. Uh, let me suggest uh, four uh, sort of principles of, uh, relating to financial markets that I think are consistent with Austrian perspectives. Uh, and uh, just sort of reflecting part my own uh, views on this. At the end, I'm going to do something terribly heretical which will probably be the end of my uh, tenure at the Austrian, at the uh, Mises Institute. I'm going to use what I will call Austrometrics uh, <laughs> to present a, uh, a statistical analysis. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on it. That it uses very much a, a, uh, uh, an Austrian perspective on the creation of wealth, uh, which is really what we're ultimately talking about. And of course, the, the, the last word on this is Professor Reisman's book, Capitalism. Uh, we were going to have, indeed, on Professor Reisman's book, uh, in, in substitution for the mud wrestling match, a weight guessing match of, <laughs> of guessing the, the weight of Professor Reisman's book. And, and then the, re, the Professor D. Lorenzo and I were actually going to contribute money, and the winner of the weight guessing would actually win the book. But, uh, uh, Neither Professor De Lorenzo or I have enough money <laughs> to pay for it. Uh, all right. Principle number one. It's hard to top Professor Rako's wit. So one tries. Uh, in the unhampered market economy, and notice that those very critical words, those five words that I start off a lot of things that people say, which is so different than the world that we're in. In the unhampered market economy, market valuations ultimately uh, depend on human action, and in particular, in terms of financial markets, on time preference and subjective valuation of goods. On time preference and subjective valuation of goods. In the final analysis, in the unhampered market economy. I'm, I'm going to enumerate these principles and then I'm going to uh, uh, elaborate a little. And I may be wrong about some of these and I will uh, be interested in the comments of my colleagues. Second, uh, changing market valuations in the uh, economy we live in reflect changing subjective valuations regarding time preference, or consumer taste, changing perceptions about the future, or governmental policy interventions. I'll repeat that. Changing market valuations reflect uh, changing subjective valuations regarding time preference or consumer taste, or changing perceptions about the future, or governmental policy interventions. Third, increases in governmental intervention in the unhampered market economy uh, uh, or inflationary uh, policies, which is a form of governmental intervention usually, uh, reduce real financial wealth. 
reduce real financial wealth. And of course, conversely, decreases in governmental intervention in the unhampered market economy or a reductions in price inflation or price inflationary policies increase real financial wealth. That's where the Austrometrics is going to come up. Uh, I actually talked someone in the government to pay me to, to reach a conclusion that Austrians have known for years, but I managed to talk someone in, at the federal level to pay me money to say this and prove it. <laughs> through a regression equation. So those of you who have not completely uh, become Austrians, uh, I, will, uh, I will convince you beyond a shadow of a doubt by giving you uh, some uh, econometric uh, gobbledygook, which will um, reinforce internal truths. Fourth, financial markets impact on other markets and vice versa. Markets are all interrelated. One cannot speak of financial markets with, uh, in, in the abstract or in isolation from other markets and vice versa. And indeed, the broader point here is there are many, of course, financial markets. There are many labor markets. Someone made the point the other day that there's not a labor market. There are many labor markets uh, and so on. And, and, but the point is they all interrelate. And you don't have to be a Valrasian general uh, equilibrium theorist. Uh, you can be a good Austrian and uh, re, uh, uh, understand this. And I might make a, a reference back to the Great Depression and repeat something I said the other day uh, relating to this point to just ex exemplify and make, it, make the point uh, further. Uh, so these are the, uh, the things I want to talk about. And we have different financial markets. And uh, I suppose one could, uh, you know, there are markets in derivatives and there are markets in uh, sort of rel relatively sophisticated. Uh, there are futures markets and, and spot markets and uh, present uh, uh, different types of markets or put and call markets. There's all kinds of financial devices that one has come up with over the years. And so, but in thinking today, uh, for simplicity purposes, and also reflecting my own ignorance, uh, we'll probably think in terms of bonds and, and equity markets, stock markets uh, in, in general, uh, in, in the presentation. Uh, actually, when I was preparing my lecture, I was thinking of the stock market. Uh, I was thinking of the market for equities. Uh, as I did this, uh, but uh, you have to also look at bonds and you have to look at uh, uh, interest rates and, and that obviously gets us into bond markets and into time preference. Uh, I, I, I got to thinking, incidentally, I, uh, I will tell you just for my, I'm not going to give you a lot of details, but in my personal life, I, I spend a good bit of time not a good bit of time, I spent a good bit of money uh, uh, engaging in my own entrepreneurial enterprises in this uh, field and have, over the years, I, I guess I've done pretty well at it, but uh, uh, I, a lot of what I've learned about this, I've learned on my own as an investor, as a, an entrepreneur. I mean, you know, we can sit around and read textbooks and talk about it, but if, you're, if, you're, if your money is at risk, uh, you become enormously focused, and <laughs> and you learn. I mean, you're for, you're lear learning has a payoff, and uh, uh, so uh, I would say that. Now, I would also say that uh, I think good Austrians will tell you you can't forecast. The, there's no sort of magic formula that allows us to forecast future values. Good entrepreneurs are people who who have, uh, uh, maybe by luck, maybe by uh, 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 a, an acute uh, uh, ability to forecast changes in subjective valuations in the future, what have you, are people that uh, are successful. Uh, uh, and uh, I don't know that I anything I will tell you will make you rich and don't think it will. The price of stocks to use that, uh, in a sense, should be sort of the discounted present value of all expected future income 
earned uh, uh, during the period that the security is held should be related to that. And indeed, uh, the uh, discounted pre- perceived discounted uh, 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 present value of all expected future income should uh, equal uh, or exceed the price of the share for a person to want to buy a stock. And uh, when I say discounted present value, I'm obviously referring to some interest rate, discount rate, which in Austrian economics means is determined by time preference. Now, in, in a, the world that we're in today, those interest rates are inflated because of inflationary expectations, because of credit creation and things of this nature. But the principle is that the discounted uh, uh, the discount rate in in terms of human action is determined by time preference if you if people are indifferent between $100 today and $103 one year from today uh, uh we could say that the rate of time preference the rate of discount is 3% and um in a world say with zero inflation or zero Expected inflation, uh, 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 monetary, inf- uh, or actually price inflation, uh, we might have a true rate of time preference of 3%. If I'm going to hold a share of stock for, say, using the rule of 72, uh, for 24 years, uh, uh, which is, in my case, a little on the optimistic side, <laughs> uh, but uh, just to use that as a, uh, an example, and I pay, uh, 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 if the price uh, is $50 today for the share of stock, and I'm, uh, the rate of true time preference is 3%, and, uh, uh, and if there's no dividends paid on these shares, and it's just uh, the, the, the return comes in the form of capital gains, uh, I would hope I, w- I would be less than successful in purchasing the sh- share if the price is less than $100 in 24 years, because a $50 compounding $50 over 24 years becomes 100, roughly speaking, in 24 years, uh, so I would have to expect in order for me to pay uh, uh, 50 a share that I'm going to get at least 100 a share. Uh, remember, this is a world of, of no inflation uh, in 24 years, and if I uh, get less than that, I have you know it's been an unsuccessful. Uh, uh, investment, or uh, and I, I have uh, so I have to earn a greater rate of, of uh, if, if if a greater rate of time preference ensues. Say we have three percent expected inflation. The rate of interest is six percent. The ordinary interest is in, is in, increased by a price inflation and inflationary premium. Uh, I would need uh, more, say three percent rate of uh, inflation. And you have 6% interest rate, 6% doubles in 12 years, uh, quadruples in uh, 24 years. So my $50 would have to be at least worth $200 for me to get a rate of return on the investment equal to what one could earn uh, 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 or equal to the interest rate dictated by human action. So uh, now what leads to changes in prices? What leads to fluctuations uh, in markets? Uh, obviously, they can fluctuate because of changes in time preference. Time preference can change. Time preference does change. Uh, I have actually just written a paper for, uh, which is for some reason much liked by the uh, Review of Austrian Economics, the other uh, Austrian journal. I write mainly for the quarterly journal of Austrian economics, the pure Austrian journal, but once in a while to uh, show my interest in diversity, uh, uh, I will write for the other uh, uh, Austrian journal. And uh, I I had something in there about the rate of time preference over the period 1970 to 2000 or something, uh, a sort of a guesstimate of what the the rate of true time preference was. I was severely castigated, and correctly so, that that rate changes over time and can change. So obviously, if the rate of time preference changes, the underlying true rate of interest should change. And as interest rates change, uh, bond prices change, as bond prices change, stock market prices change because of portfolio effects. Uh, if a rate of interest on something, I guess this is, I just am assuming 
everyone knows this, but if the rate of interest on a security on a bond is a 6%, and let's say it's a $1,000 bond on the, uh, uh, that the, the face value of the bond is $1,000 and the current price is $1,000, uh, and it's paying 6%, it's a 6% bond, this current rate of interest on a bond of this degree of risk is 6%. Uh, and if, of course, the interest rate were to rise to, say, 7%, the bond price would fall uh, because it would take about, a, uh, to get a 7% yield, the bond would only ha could be worth about $850. It's a little more complicated than that because of maturities and so forth. Let's say these are British consuls, keep it simple, which are lifetime bonds. Uh, and so the price of bonds obviously varies inversely. Uh, with the rate of interest. Um, so a determination of security prices seems to be, you start with time preference as your sort of your basis, and then you go secondly to uh, changes. And uh, why do security prices change? Why, why have we had this huge up and down in the uh, NASDAQ, uh, in the uh, dot com? You know, is this a sign of market failure? Uh, uh, I don't think so. And, and it's a, uh, many fluctuations are a sign of government failure, I will argue in a minute. But, but to the extent we have changes in subjective valuations of goods uh, as a second factor, uh, we have first a change in time preference. Secondly, we have changes over time in su subjective valuation of goods and services. We like new things. We develop new tastes. There's new technologies come along. And so with that comes uh, changes in uh, 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 the things we want to buy. We decide we like buying books on the internet. Uh, so obviously, this um, we we see people buying books on the internet. So we get the bright idea: if people are buying books on the internet, someone is making money selling books on the internet. And so, uh, gee, I'm going to go buy Amazon.com. Uh, and a lot of people do this. I didn't, by the way. I I I, I was. I'm a gold standard man. I'm also, I don't buy flaky stocks, uh, 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 which I view Amazon, well, it wasn't flaky, but it just wasn't my cup of tea. Uh, and uh, so we have increases in valuations because of changing subjective values. A critical third factor in changing prices over time of stocks or bonds or anything else, particularly uh, talk in terms of, of equities, are changes in expectations because the, the value of a stock is, is determined in part by the expected future earnings uh, that will be earned as a consequence of the purchase in this investment. So changes in expectations are critical uh, in determining uh, 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 the prices of individual shares and are also, of course, important in looking at broad market aggregates. So as we have, uh, uh, ex as people become, quote, more optimistic, uh, to use an expression Professor Rako used in another context in the last lecture with regards to the, he was talking about the Industrial Revolution, we talk about optimists and pessimists. If, you, if people collectively become more optimistic about the future, one would expect, uh, uh, one's, uh, one would expect uh, uh, ex uh, expectations regarding earnings to rise, uh, and with that, the discounted present value of future earnings would also rise, and, and therefore the demand, quantity demand, demand for shares would rise relative to the supply, and prices would be pushed upwards. And so um, uh, we, we see uh, expectations as something that are volatile, something that are fragile, and something that can change. Uh, uh, readily. Now, ch expectations can change for reasons unrelated to government. They can change, uh, uh, let's put on a, the hat of a, some would say pseudo-Austrian. He's truly an Austrian, uh, but Austrian in nationality, but uh, is often linked with the Austrian school in ways that uh, most Aust pure Austrians would not find particularly uh, agree with, namely Joseph Schumpeter, the uh, the economist who uh, lived from 1883 to 1950 he was born in the same year as Keynes uh, was, if I recall. Actually, 
in the same year that Marx died. 1883 was a vintage year uh, uh, in economics. Uh, uh, one bad guy died, one good guy was born. I mean, one bad guy died, one good guy, uh, 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 one, another ba- good guy, another bad guy was born, and who knows what Schumpeter was, sort of in between, I guess. Uh, and Schumpeter, uh, you know, argued uh, as, as early as 1912, writing about the same time, that, or earlier than that, about the, roughly the time that Mises was writing the theory of money and credit. Uh, and Schumpeter was arguing, talking about waves and uh, 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 innovation and the importance of innovation and changing innovation in uh, uh, explaining uh, aggregate economic change and sort of in some sense uh, maybe a predecessor of the real business cycle theory that has come since. And it is true that one could have uh, periods in, one, in, in historical periods where their rate of, in, 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 uh, of innovation and technological change seems to have increased. And that seems to have been, some would argue, a factor in the rise of the NASDAQ, uh, that somehow people got it in their minds, whether this is true or not. I, I think it's an interesting hi- historical uh, issue, whether in fact innovation has increased that much. I am my suspicious of it. I think change has been a way of life from the, for hundreds of years since the Industrial Revolution. But one, you know, the thinking in the late 90s was, gee... We're in a new economy. Remember that expression? New economy. Somehow all the old rules of economic behavior no longer apply. You, know, you Austrians, you know, you're kind of old, fuddy duddies. And the, the new rules apply. We're in a new economy. I'd go to these con- conferences. I'd read things in the Wall Street Journal. There was, I think Krugman or someone wrote a thing in the Wall Street Journal that said, the business cycle is dead. Uh, because we're in a new economy. We're so much smarter than the people used to be. And uh, uh, at, but, but in the area of innovation, we have, we're, we're in, inventing more. We're, 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 the, the, there's synergies of change. There are sort of economies of scale in innovation. One innovation leads to another at a faster pace. And somehow the pace of economic change is growing in the computer age. We're in one of these epic periods, like the steam engine was an epic invention in, Ameri- in world history in the 18th century. And uh, there, there are great innovations, inventions that come along that spur uh, spurts in, in technological change. And we're in this, and this is... So people went out and bought NASDAQ, NASDAQ stocks, which were largely... Uh, uh, technology, so-called technology stocks, computer stocks, and so forth, and we had a run-up in the Nasdaq to uh, four or five thousand from um, much lower levels within a period of a few years. Nasdaq closed yesterday below two was well was below two thousand, I might add. So we had this rising expectations followed by a period of dashed expectations, I guess you would call, or, or disappointed expectations. And a lot of the companies, uh, uh, the expectations were out of line uh, with uh, uh, any realistic evaluation of the future. There was a bit of a herd instinct, and not the first time in history, uh, not the last. Anyone who's studied economic history knows these things happen every now and then, uh, and, and so forth. Uh, so changes in expectations can come about, have nothing to do with government, but a lot of the changing expectations about uh, business enterprises in the current economy, not the unhampered market economy, reflect government actions. And a lot of the so-called volatility in markets is, is government-induced. There always will be go- volatility in markets. Volatility in markets is good. I, I mean, I, I think changes in prices is what drives the economy. What's, what's, which, that's what reallocates resources. That's what takes resources from one use to the other. It was the rise in the NASDAQ that allowed for huge amounts of resources to move into these technology industries. It was the rise in the uh, NASDAQ, uh, the rise in the uh, stock market that uh, funded an enormous amount of productive capital activity. 
And uh, it, is, it is the fall in the stock market in the Great Depression that led to a decline in new investment, in, along with many other things in that period, uh, and reflecting the fact that the economy was shrinking rather than growing. These are, the markets are, are sending important, powerful signals. But a lot of the variations in security prices... Uh, a lot of the so-called volatility in markets that lead Al Gore, that great financial guru, the ever-growing Al Gore, uh, to say, you know, we can't trust people to put their money, in Social Security funds, in private equities. In some ways, I agree with him. I don't want the government messing, you know, starting buying up industry. I sort of, in some ways, sort of agree. I think the Social Security system ought to be completely scrapped. But nonetheless, uh, Al Gore says equities are too dangerous for real for people to buy, even though 50% of Americans, one way or the other, already own them. Uh, but you know the, we can't let that happen. Well, part of those volatility that the the uh, 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 enemies of classical liberty talk about are imposed by government themselves. And if I may mention three or four of them, uh, three or four examples, uh, uh, I will. Uh, well, I'm going to whether I may or not. Uh, I don't have tenure, but I have the podium. First, changes in taxation and expected taxation. Uh, at a discussion on macroeconomics last night, uh, Professor Reisman made the point, which I uh, concurred with, that the ultimate sort of measure of government, I think, is government spending, or a key variable is government spending as a part of GDP. It's really a measure of resource usage, but people do pay taxes. And when taxes are changed, uh, uh, capital valuation uh, expected of uh, future gains from shares or from uh, equities or even bonds change. And uh, we have uh, uh, changes in the stocks. If you look at the history of the United States in terms of equity prices, uh, we had a disaster from 19, mid-60s to about early 1980s. And it's a disaster. We had significant declines in equity prices corrected for inflation. And I, I am aware of the difficulties in correcting for inflation. I am aware of the Austrian uh, uh, concerns about the construction of price indices. Indeed, I gave a lecture on this uh, yesterday. But nonetheless, I think by any reasonable measure, there was a significant decline in equity prices in this period, and uh, indeed the Dow in the summer of 1982 was under 900, and it was above that level in 1966, I think. So it, in, in nominal terms, it wasn't rising. In real terms, with all the inflation going on, and of course it was the inflation itself that caused a lot of this. But, but in addition to that, inflation interacts with tax law in a perverse fashion. Uh, let's suppose you went and bought uh, a share of, let's say, uh, well, I guess we should put this in terms of your parents or maybe looking at the ages of the, maybe your grandparents. Uh, uh, let's say your grandfather in 1970 purchased uh, a share or a hundred shares of XYZ Corporation. I, I make it whatever company you want and paid $5,000, uh, this is money uh, uh, that he, he was setting aside for his retirement. And let's assume that retirement occurred in the year 2000, at which time uh, uh, he decided to sell the shares uh, in order uh, to put it into investments with a higher yield to, uh, to provide income for retirement. Let's say in the year 2000, this individual sold those shares for $10,000. Now, the U.S. government would tell you the following in the year 2000. They would say, you made a capital gain of $5,000. We will tax this capital gain at, is it 20%? Let's say 20%. There are state and local uh, capital gains taxes, so the actual effective rate of taxation actually varies slightly across the country, but we'll just 
keep the example simple, say 20%, which is about right. So the government in the year 2000 would demand $1,000 in payment uh, at the time you sell the stock. And uh, the real, if we, we can quibble about the true rate of inflation from the year 1970 to the year 2000, price inflation, but no one will quibble, that, that no one will deny that it happened. And if you look at the conventional price indices, they tripled or quadrupled. Prices tripled or quadrupled. It's just a question of exactly what figure. Let's say they quadrupled. Uh, 5000 It takes $20,000 in the year 2000 to buy, on average, what 5000 bought in 1970. So what you did in 2000 is you sold your stock. You, you really now have less purchasing power than you did 30 years earlier, and the government asked for $1,000. It's, it's theft. It's robbery. So incidentally, my, I will never, ever, ever sell a share of stock unless forced to, you know, a company buyout. And, and that's a little irrational, but I, absolutely, it, I derive enormous disutility from writing a check to the federal government that I don't have to write. I don't want to give them any money. I'll even, you know, I'll put up with a lot of nonsense from companies that I think are crazy uh, before I'll write them a, a penny, pay them a penny of capital gains tax. So I'm going to hold on till I die because when I die under current state tax law, uh, current law, which will probably change, I think it is changing, uh, 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 I can avoid capital gains taxes by dying. <laughs> uh, so, uh, in public finance, they call this the lock-in effect. And, or in, uh, it is. I mean, I remember Dan Troop Smith and a bunch of uh, you know, Harvard uh, types, uh, uh, actually reasonable public finance experts, said, you know, this is a problem with capital gains tax. So, resources are afraid to move. I'm, I'm afraid to sell shares because I'm going to have to pay taxes, in some cases, taxes on non-existent real gains. And so, when we lower the capital gains tax, which is always a, a uh, suggestion that some have, we tend to have positive effect on security prices. When we raise the capital gains tax, we tend to have a negative effect. You can actually, this is one of those rare cases, and this is, poses a bit of a, a dilemma for libertarians, you can, you can lower the capital gains tax and raise more money. Uh, uh, you know, if you lower it to zero, obviously, you might raise more money. I'm talking about government tax revenue. You can lower the capital gains tax in the U.S., say, to 15% or something. I'm sure revenues would rise. They have always in the past. This is the Laffer curve really at work. Uh, but then, do you really want to give more money to the government, you know? On the one hand, you don't want to get more money to the government, but on the other hand, the system of the capital gains taxes are totally irrational. I mean, they're, just, they're irrational. And so uh, therein lies the problem. All right. Another, uh, of course, major cause of... Uh, what time is this lecture over? 3.15? 3.30? 3 3.15. Please, don't... There's a limited amount I know, and <laughs> you're pushing me to make it to 315. Uh, uh, I am going to take generous amounts of questions, actually. No. Uh, a, 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 another reason for uh, security valuations uh, uh, changing uh, that is government-related, of course, relates to ex inflation and expectations with regards to inflation. Now, if we listen to Professor Natoff and to Professor Reisman and adopted a gold standard with 100% uh, reserves and so forth, and we move to a sound money system, there is no question in my mind. I mean, on this, this one, I would bank my entire assets, everything I own on this. There's no question in my mind this would have a very positive impact on, on uh, the uh, values, wealth values in this country. Because wealth values are deflated by expectations of the deteriorations in the value of the currency unit. 
This is obviously true in bond markets. It's, it's crystal clear in bond markets. When inflation goes up, bond prices go down because you're getting paid back in dollars of less, less smaller purchasing power. There's an inflationary risk. And, but bond prices impact stock prices. You have $1,000, $10,000 invested in bonds. Uh, the bond declines in price because of rising inflationary expectation, uh, meaning higher interest rates, not because of changes in time preference, not because of human action, but because of foolishness. Printing of money. We print money. What happens when you print money? When you print money, M goes up, Bond prices go down. Uh, 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 interest rates go up. Bond prices go down. And I would argue stock prices go down. You have the $10,000 bond. As bond prices fall to $7,000 or whatever, uh, as bond prices fall, some people would sell their stocks to buy the bonds at the lower price because, you know, oh, bond, pr bond prices are falling relative to stock prices. So what do they do? That makes stocks a little less attractive as well. So they sell their stocks. People used to say stocks are an infl a hedge against inflation. There is no hedge against inflation, in my opinion. I, and I know, I, I mean, I was, uh, I invested, uh, you know, a lot in that period. Uh, it, it, that period, my whole life, still, the period's still going on. You know, the last year of the Consumer Price Index of the United States, which is not the last arbiter of prices, maybe not even the first arbiter of changing prices. The last year it fell was 1955. Uh, so uh, in the lifetime, uh, the adult lifetime of any American under the age of 65, there has never been anything but inflation. Uh, and uh, for those of you from some nations, uh, it's worse. Okay. Now, uh, including France, I suspect. I remember when I was a young man, I used to remember how the, I'd go to Paris and the, we had those old Frank, new Frank, de Gaulle things, what, about 1960, wasn't that about? It was, it was strange. Uh, uh, but uh, I, don't, I shouldn't be bashing the French when they have no chance to reply. And it, but what I'm saying is it's, it, it's the same the world over. It's... Uh, because we have no anchor to money anywhere, so why should it be any difference in France? It seems the further you get to closer to the equator, the worse it seems to get. And I, I don't completely know the answer to that. And I don't know what the Austrians had to say about that. The Italians are a little worse than the French on average. Uh, you know, uh, the Zimbabwe's are. You know, I don't even know what. Do they even have money there? I don't know. <laughs> uh, uh, so. In any case, uh, another thing that uh, has an impact and I think a pernicious impact on security markets are disguised forms of governmental intervention, disguised in the sense that they're less explicit, they're more uh, uh, less transparent, they're more hidden. And I'm thinking particularly of the rise in regulation, uh, environmental rules and regulation, safety rules and regulation, uh, and so forth. I once estimated in one of my econometric fantasies uh, exercises that I was engaged in, uh, uh, I was uh, in the mid-90s, that the cost to the American economy annually of government regulation was a trillion dollars a year, and another economist came in with similar estimate, uh, Tom Hopkins at the University, Rochester Institute of Technology. And whether these numbers are right or wrong, we all know that there's a very significant burden placed on business enterprises by various governmental rules. The greater those burdens are, you can look at these as sort of hidden taxes, uh, the potential exists that, the, that they can lower rates of return on investment. Particularly, the one, incidentally, in some cases, uh, t uh, say uh, electric utility companies, of course, that was a regulated uh, area of any way, but uh, these utility companies would be forced to spend hundreds of millions of dollars on uh, environmental improvements that did nothing to increase output at all. 
uh, which in and of itself, by itself, would tend to lower rates of return and potential profitability. And of course, another governmental activity that is guaranteed to have an impact on securities markets are, is, are wars. Nothing like a good war to impact the stock market. In some cases, it will impact, you know, the, the impact is, uh, is diverse, it varies, and, and obviously varies with the company. General Dynamics is not a bad company to own, I guess, uh, when we're going to war. Uh, but, uh, uh, incidentally, uh, my first investments as a young man, I do have to, man, I shouldn't tell these things, I guess, but... In, uh, I uh, purchased, I uh, actually inherited a little stock, actually quite a bit of stock, uh, in a baby food company, Gerber Baby Food, in 1963, I think it was. I was a young man. And I also bought a share, one share. I was a poor man. I was a college student. I paid $48.25, and I bought a share of General Dynamics. And I thought, ah, I'm the, I've got it made. Because two things are going to happen. Our people are going to keep fighting with one another forever, hence general dynamics. And they're going to, and I was using sort of Malthusian logic here, uh, they're going to procreate because of another natural propensity of human beings. And that means they have to eat baby food. Well, you know, I missed out on both of them a little bit. Um, the general dynamics didn't do too badly. The other one was doing badly until... Some European company came along and paid an outrageous price for it, about 75 times earnings, and I turned out to do all right, even though I had to write an awfully large check to the federal government. Okay. The, the point I'm making here is that a significant uh, uh, impact on security prices are, are government-determined. Uh, now to the Austrometrics, quickly. Uh, there are data available, and, I, and I'm well. There are da data available on the Dow Jones Industrial Average, which I do trust. I mean, I think it's reasonably good data, and uh, uh, I deflated those for inflation by the CPI. Now that's not good data, uh, but it it's a rough measure of inflation. So I calculated what I call the real Dow. And I did this in different ways, but I did it quarterly from 1980, January 1980, through the first quarter or second quarter, I guess it was, of the year 2000. So I had 80-some observation, a quarterly data on a key measure of security prices in the United States, the most uh, widely uh, looked at uh, uh, index. And I said, what kind of classical liberal variables could I come up with that would explain movements in this? And I want to keep it simple. I came, I could read, I came up with two variables. They're impeccably classically liberal, classical liberal variables that could explain 97% of the variation in the real Dow over that 21 years. Peckable, if you're interested in the boring thing, econometric, you know, wonderful Dickey Fuller tests. You know, I, I'm sure you're all interested in Dickey Fuller tests. That's stationary, you know. I, anyway, I did all the bells and whistles that the econometrician technocrats tell you to do. And what were the two variables? Now, you can read all this in any of a hundred different Austrian economists. You can read it in Professor Riesman's work. You can talk to Dr. Nata. He would tell you the same thing, but because of this technocratic religion we have today that we have to prove things through testing, uh, I tested. And my two variables were the size of government as a percentage of the national output. And, that, and even that's very difficult to measure because of the dis you know, disguise regulations, or you can't truly measure it. It's an understatement. But we do have government expenditures as a percentage of GDP. And it's, it's a rough and ready measure of the size of government. And the second variable I used was the rate of price inflation, the change in the CPI. Just two variables, just simple little model, dependent variable, real Dow, independent variables, government as a percentage of GDP, and the change in the consumer price index. If you're really interested in reading this, it is published in a paper called Wealth and Poverty Revisited, 
uh, published by, do I dare say this? The Joint Economic Committee of Congress of the United States. I got the gang of 535 to pay for this. And the, uh, the results are, are, are classic. If the Dow goes up, I mean, if the uh, CPI goes up, if inflation goes up, the Dow goes down. In fact, each one percentage point in the CPI, and this, uh, this data is, in, I think, $82, $84. The Dow went down 143 points for every 1% increase in prices. For every 1% that the government took of our money, or our, uh, of what we produce in, in terms of, of their expenditures, every 1% increase in expenditures, the Dow fell 570 points. And these are in $82 or something. I think in current dollars, it's about 1,000 points. So, government has an absolutely enormous impact. So then, someone said to me, well, Professor Vetter, the Dow isn't very good. It's the wrong index. What do you want me to use? So someone said, use the Federal Reserve System. We all, you know, love and trust the Federal Reserve. Uh, so I took their data from the, uh, what they call flow and funds accounts. I took their data on a net wealth in the United States. They actually have a net worth statistic. I actually calculated on a per capita basis back to 1947. So I use annual data. I'll use annual data instead of quarterly data. I won't look at the Dow. I'll look at wealth, total wealth. Wealth. That includes everything. It includes homes. It includes everything. And I use the same two variables. Government uh, as a percentage of GDP and the change in CPI. I also, for this regression, I had to put a third variable in. I put in the, 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 the actual size of national output itself. You would expect wealth to rise uh, with the growth in the economy. So, controlling for the size of the economy won't get as good a result. I mean, remember, I said I could explain 97%. They were right. The results changed. I now can explain 98.3%. Two classical liberal variables. Two classical liberal variables. Two Austrian variables. That's why I call this Austrometrics. Incidentally, Murray Rothbard, who has pretty good credentials as an Austrian, I think. <laughs> Murray Rothbard, I wrote a paper which was published in the first journal first issue of the Review of Austrian Economics by Murray. He was the editor, dictator of it. Uh, he, he had to go through some refereeing process, but it was all for show. He told me, actually, I have a classic letter from Murray. He said, I'm forced to have double-blind referees to read your paper. And these referees, of course, read the paper. One of them said it was a lousy paper. The other one says you need to make 42 changes, a long list of changes. Murray says, I accept the paper. If you want to make the changes, do so. If you don't, fine. But uh, anyway, I made the changes and I said, Murray, I'm going to put some regression analysis in this paper, but I'll put it in the appendix so not to offend uh, most Austrians, but it, 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 enforces, it, it reinforces Austrian principles. Murray says there are good statistics and bad statistics. If it supports Austrian principles, that's good statistics and put it in. <laughs> So much for praxeology and uh, methodological uh, approaches to, and, and I did because it helped uh, sell the, you know, the ideas, and and, that, and I, I do this all the time because it helps sell ideas among mainstream uh, 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 economists and uh, individuals. So what I'm saying is the the price that the classical liberal. Uh, in all, an Austrian way of looking at the world. A world where you have uh, price stability, maybe price, uh, price deflation, in, in a world of no monetary inflation, price deflation, Professor Natoff's world, Professor Riesman's world, my world. I studied, incidentally, under a gold standard man. 
at the University of Illinois, Donald Kemmer, you may, may, may the uh, Edwin Kemmerer's son. Uh, in a world a price w w where you don't have crea uh, monetary uh, uh, disturbances because of paper money creation, you would have a lot more wealth. And with more wealth, I think you would have more output. With more wealth, you would have more, more financial wealth. You would have more real wealth because the, the financial economy and the real economy are tied together. Now, the one point I didn't say, and I'm already losing my audience, uh, and I made this point the other day, but I, I'd like to briefly repeat it. How my financial markets and other markets tie together. Um, I talked about the Great Depression the other day, and I argued that you first had these financial disturbances in the 20s because of the Fed, the Federal Reserve uh, engaging in monetary inflation, which led to price inflation, uh, uh, beyond what would have been the case in the absence of that paper money creation. In the absence of that paper money creation, prices would have fallen in the 20s. There's, there's no doubt about it in my mind. Historically, that's what happened. The, the, the deflation in prices that should happen, happen in the 20s didn't because of this monetary creation. So this leads to disturbances, and Professor Garrison and others talked about this, and I won't go through all that, but it led to problems in the real economy one manifestation of that, of several manifestations, was the stock market crash in 1929. But in response to what was a fi initially a financial problem, became a, a problem elsewhere in other markets because of government policies. The Smoot-Hawley tariff we uh, sometimes uh, mention. We, we raised marginal tax rates to 70% or so. But the thing that I particularly love to concentrate on was Herbert Hoover's uh, policy of, of maintaining wages at a high level. And what that did, wages were kept high, and so in the, in, in the markets for goods, we had profits depressed because of government policies, which while not mandatory, had a, a, a strong moral suasion to it, and businessmen followed them for fear of not following them. And as a consequence, profits were depressed. And as a consequence, profits being depressed, bank loans became... Uh, dangerous. Banks were lending money to companies uh, which were losing money, uh, and and they were the the, uh, pre, the risk premium of lending grew. As the risk premium of lending grew, security prices of banks were misstated. The book values exceeded the real values. First, stockholders got edgy. They sold their bank stocks. I can prove it. You want proof? I can prove it. Look what happened to you know the price of banks. I incidentally constructed on my own a bank stock index for the year 1930. One of the craziest things I ever did in my life. I had to go through old newspapers and all and find you know what what's happening to the bank of uh, you know the price of uh, the, the Chase Bank today. You know blah blah blah. For, for the, I had to sweat a little bit, which I'm not used to. Uh, and so. Uh, we had the depression in banks. I mean, we had this, and then depositors started to get fearful. We have fractional reserves, remember? Remember fractional reserves? The whole system is dependent on people having trust in banks, faith. So people started taking their money out of banks, and that led to a huge uh, financial uh, problem, which added, in a way, to the real economy problem. And uh, so what happened started in financial markets spread... And we had a problem in the labor market because of government intervention. And that comes back again on the financial market. In this case, into banks. Into banks. And uh, 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 the story goes on. There's much more of the story. I told this story before. I don't want to repeat it uh, too much again. So one market impacts the other. The financial markets ultimately have to reflect, in some sense, the real economy. And, uh, and that's that. I uh, will stop here and thank you. And I will take questions. <laughs> Any questions or comments on anything I said? We have some investors. We actually have one or two members of the class who are in the investment business or in the financial business. So uh, I'd be interested in any comments they'd have. Or anyone else, for that matter. Anyone have anything to say? Yes, sir.
You think people move prices? Just by the fact that they think it's going to rise, therefore they buy it before it does and actually rise. Well, prices move when uh, people's uh, uh, perceptions of what's going to happen change. And, uh, it is true uh, when a broker makes a recommendation, buy Eastman Kodak. It'll rise the day they make that recommendation. Always. I mean, almost always. People listen to these. And now there's a big hassle. You know, whether the people making these recommendations own shares in these companies themselves, this insider information. And of course, uh, there are those who say we should prohibit this. And uh, my view is uh, uh, no, but uh, uh, let the buyer be aware. Incidentally, aside from the usual objection, there's a little other things called uh, freedom of speech and expression involved here, quite apart from any of the standard economic arguments that have come up earlier. And so my view is, uh, 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 we, my view is a great Chicago economist, George Stigler, I mean, he, he said a lot of things that Austrians don't like, but he, he despised the Securities and Exchange Commission from day one. And, uh, you know, I think he was right. I, mean, I don't know, it has done a thing uh, uh, for us. Any other observation? I thought you were going to ask about efficient markets. Are markets efficient? And uh, that's always an interesting issue. And I deliberately tried to avoid that one today because I think in a way, in, I will say this, Austrians are dubious of people who claim they can predict. My, incidentally, my market, I cannot predict the stock market from my, unless I know in advance what's going to happen to government as a percentage of GDP. If I know in advance what's going to happen to inflation, in theory, I can predict. Well, if everyone knows, if everyone knows that inflation's going to fall, there will be other people out there to take advantage of the opportunities. So I don't claim, if I thought I could make money off this, I wouldn't be, uh, you know, uh, uh, working in Auburn, Alabama for a living. Uh, I would be living uh, on the Riviera in France, uh, the Côte d'Azur, a $20 million home or something. Uh, uh, but... Uh, 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 so I, I, I'm very skeptical of people claim they can make money because they have, you know, they have a unusual perception, but some people are, you know, fortunate. Uh, I told you my story about George Soros the other day. George Soros says that, uh, you know, markets can't be trusted. Markets don't work. You know, and there's the man who's, he was telling me this in his Fifth Avenue apartment. Uh, uh, underneath one of his Picassos or whatever it was on the wall. Uh, so, any, any other comment? Yes, sir. Well, there is a relationship. I, I don't know. Uh, are you thinking like? Are you thinking gold? By the way, that's an uh, that's an interesting an interesting an interesting lecture, and I think probably Professor Natafa ought to give it in. Not today, though. Uh, would be the impact. There's a lot of. There are a number of serious people who think the price of gold is, an, in and of itself, an extremely interesting uh, price. And I think it is an interesting price. I, I do look at the price of gold. I do look at the price of gold. I, do, I think it tells you a good bit. And it also tells you what people think about inflationary expectations. And thus, I think you could probably run a regression. I have not done this where you look at the price of gold and relate it to security prices and come up with interesting things. Generally, when the speaking, when the price of gold goes up, there's greater inflationary expectations, and I suspect probably that has an adverse effect on security prices. So there would be a negative relationship. So, yes, there is a relationship between...